We're kicking off 21 days of uh, prayer and, and fasting starting today. Man, I'm so glad you're excited about that. Hallelujah. And, and the purpose really is to experience God's blessing and break through the rest of the year. How many want to have 2023 be better than 2022 in terms of God's blessing and increase and, and just walking in the, in the blessings of God and the purposes of God, the plans of God for your life? Now, sometimes we need to do a little something at the beginning to experience God's blessing all the way through. And I'm sure there's probably every single person here that needs some kind of breakthrough. When I say breakthrough, I'm meaning that you need a change. You need God to do something that you haven't been able to do. You, you haven't been able to fix the problem or you haven't been able to, 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 to get ahead in some area and you need God's intervention. Hey, am I talking to anybody here today that might need some kind of breakthrough in your life? You might need a breakthrough in a health problem, breakthrough in your marriage. You just can't get the marriage to work, it seems like. Or maybe you got some prodigal children or grandchildren that are away from God, and you just want to see him come back to Jesus. You know that's the best place for him, right? It's no good being out in the world. They need to be right in the center of God's will. Or maybe you need a breakthrough in your finances, or, or maybe it's just a relationship with God. Your, your heart's cold. You just don't have that, that passion and love for God and, and for, for his word that you once did, and you want to see God ignite that fire. Again, there's all kinds of reasons to fast, all kinds of breakthroughs that are, are necessary. Uh, but one of the keys is what I'm going to be talking about today. The title of my message is The Fast That Frees. It's fasting combined with prayer. It's not, it's not the only tool that we have in our tool belt, but it's a big one. It's an important one. Let me just clarify what fasting is, in case you're not sure. Fasting is simply abstaining from food for, physical, for spiritual purposes. Abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Now, that can be abstaining for, from all food for a, a period of time. You might just simply miss a meal or miss two meals in a day or, or miss meals for two or three days or however long you want to go. There's people that fast as much as seven days, 21 days. I know guys that have done complete fast, water only for 40 days. They're supermen in my mind. I don't know how on earth you can do that. But if you're called by God, and I'm sure they were, you have to be called by God to do that. There has to be a special grace on your life. But we're all called to do some kind of fasting. And uh, some of us will be doing what's, uh, what we call a Daniel's fast. It's out of Daniel's chapter 10, where Daniel, for 21 days, the Bible says he ate no pleasant food. That means no Cheetos, no Doritos, no ding-dongs, no Burger King. <laughs> you guys, I'm starting to hear your favorite foods out there. <laughs> no pleasant food. Essentially, it's giving up meat, bread, dairy, and sweets. And basically, they're eating fruits and vegetables and some whole grains and some legumes, uh, which are beans, thrown in there. Um, if, no, if, if, no, if nothing else happens, you're going to get healthier. But spiritually, I believe there's going to be some things happen. There's going to be some, some breakthroughs. And so uh, Bobby and I also, we, we, we fast entertainment. I mean, we just turn off the Netflix. We, we get Hollywood out of our brain. How many know that's a good thing? We probably get way too much of that. I mean, Bobby and I don't spend a ton of time doing it, but probably more than we need to, actually. Uh, you go home and you're tired and, oh, I just want to veg, sit on the the couch and, and just get blasted with whatever's on Netflix or your fav favorite streaming platform. But, you know, we just turn that off. It's a time of tuning out all the other voices so that we can hear the only voice that matters. And that's God's. How many know we need to hear God's voice in this day and age? We need to hear God. If you're facing a major problem, major decision, you need to hear God. And sometimes we got to put the flesh down and all the physical appetites in order to get our spirit up to a place where we can actually tune in and hear God. Amen? So essentially, we're seeking God at the beginning of the year so we can enjoy His blessings the rest of the year. That doesn't mean this is the only time that, that you need to fast. I really think God... 
uh, is interested in us making fasting and prayer just a regular part of our spiritual disciplines. Anybody ever read the Bible? Do you pray every once in a while? You attend church, those are all spiritual disciplines. Fasting should be included right there with that. Now, I know it's not pleasant. Uh, Probably no one likes fasting more than me. When my kids were small, (laughs) growing up, we we taught them not to use the word hate. You know, they would want to say things like, I hate, I hate asparagus. Or I hate math. I said, don't, no, we we don't want to use that word hate. Use something else. So they came up with this phrase to express their extreme displeasure they would say, I dislike math with a fiery passion. (laughs) Or I dislike vegetables with a fiery passion. Well, I just got to say, when it comes to fasting, I dislike it with a fiery passion. (laughs) But I like the results. I I like the benefits. You know, when I played sports, you know, the coaches always say, no pain, no gain. While they sent you running around the lap one more, the field one more time. You know, your tongue's hanging out. At times, I I disliked my coaches with a fiery passion when they did that. But, uh, you know, their their idea is that, hey, you need to experience a little discomfort in order to achieve your goals and your objectives. And it's the same way spiritually. Sometimes we've got to experience a little bit of discomfort physically in order to achieve our spiritual goals and objectives. God wants us to grow up. God wants us to mature. There's things that he wants us to to walk in, some knowledge, some truth, some understanding, some power, some dominion, some authority. And and sometimes it just takes a little bit of denying yourself. The Bible says if you're going to follow me, Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you got to what? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And so this is part of that denying ourselves. Now, Jesus had an expectation that all of his followers would fast. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, when you fast, notice he didn't say if you fast. He said, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. The only reason you fast is to get the accolades of of people around you. That's going to be the only reward you're going to get. Jesus went on to say, but when you fast... Not if, when, put oil in your head, wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees, notice he's going to see what you're doing. Doesn't matter if anybody else knows. He's going to know, he's going to see, and he's going to see what's done in secret, and he will reward you. He's going to reward you. Anybody here like rewards? I like rewards. I heard about a woman uh, who opened her front door to go out one morning to get her newspaper. And there was a little dog that she didn't even know who was sitting there with the newspaper, her newspaper, in his mouth. And had just delivered it right to her porch. And she was so excited about that, she gave him a treat. What a nice little doggy. The next morning, she opens the door to go out and get her paper. And here's the same dog surrounded by eight newspapers. So she spent the rest of the morning taking newspapers back to the, back to the neighbor. Every, everybody likes rewards, right? And God says he will personally get involved in rewarding you and I when we step into this discipline called fasting with prayer. Now, it's fasting with prayer. It's not just fasting. Fasting without prayer, that's a, that's a tough diet right there. Uh, you might lose some weight, but that's about it. Uh, we need to... We're, we're basically looking for more opportunity, rather than spend a whole bunch of time, you know, fixing dinners and and just going to restaurants and hanging out, we're we're dedicating that time to seeking the Lord. Amen. So this morning, I want to give you uh, four benefits of fasting and prayer. We're probably actually only going to get through two and probably cover the next two uh, next week. Four benefits of fasting and prayer. You know, the, the Lord is good to us. You know, he knows that certain things are kind of difficult, sometimes are challenging for us. And so he always lays out the rewards. If you do this, this is, this is what gets to happen in your life. There's some rewards. Number one, fasting is a means of humbling our soul. Humbling our soul. You might be saying, Pastor, I thought you were going to 
Talk about rewards. I thought you were going to talk about benefits. Is humbling my soul, is that a benefit? Well, absolutely it is because there are so many benefits and blessings that come to those who walk in humility before God. Jesus likes humility. Let me, let me say that again. I think some of you are sleeping there. Jesus likes humility. In fact, the Bible describes, Jesus himself described himself in Matthew chapter 11 as being gentle and humble in heart. Jesus was humble. He was a humble man. He walked in humility. Jesus likes humility. But he's turned off by pride. He's turned off uh, by arrogance. Pride, of course, is called one of those seven deadly sins and actually is number one on the list of seven deadly sins. Pride is the original sin. Pride was what was in Lucifer's heart in heaven when he was the music minister, the music pastor of heaven. But he got pride in his heart and he started to think that he was as good as God or maybe better. And he, he said, five I wills. And the first one, I believe, was I will ascend to the throne of God. I will. You know, when you start thinking of yourself as better than somebody else, that pride uh, gets in, you start comparing yourself to others and thinking you're better than somebody else, that's pride. That, that's arrogance. Anytime that you put I in the center of your life, it's all about me. You're not thinking about God, you're not thinking about other people, you're not thinking about God's purposes. When I is in the center, when you, self, is sitting on the center of your throne, that's pride. Anytime you start asserting my will and what I want and my needs and my happiness, when, you know, it's, it's pride. And anytime that you act independently from God, independently from God, that's pride. I, I know we often think of pride as kind of that uh, braggart who's boasting about all of his accomplishments. And we look at somebody like that and kind of turns us off and we think, well, man, I'm thankful that I'm not like that. But pride can be a lot more subtle than that. Pride can be lurking in our hearts and likely is in every single one of our hearts in some way, shape, or form, and we just simply haven't really noticed it. We haven't observed it. We're not really aware of it. Anytime that you act independently from God, there's pride that's going on. Anytime that you make decisions without consulting God. James writes this in James chapter 4. He said, now listen, you who say to today or tomorrow... We will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. And that's true. You don't. And I don't. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so if we're making decisions outside of God's guidance, if we're not praying about our business, we're not praying about our decisions, praying about our future, praying about our purchases, whatever it might be, every area of our life, we're just straight ahead, you know, I got a plan, I got an idea, get out of my way, then we're acting independently uh, from God. We're actually flying in the dark. He went on to say, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, then we will live and do this and do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. Someone once said, prayerlessness is the greatest arrogance. Prayerlessness is the greatest arrogance. If you think that you can navigate through life or even one day without consulting God, without seeking His guidance, without seeking His blessing, His provision, His protection on your life, that's arrogance. And, and it's pride at the root of it. You're walking in pride. God doesn't like pride. He, he knows how dangerous it is to the human life, to the human heart. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. You know, if, if you and I are walking in pride and arrogance and independence, then, then God actually opposes. He literally sets himself against us. No wonder you can't get ahead if you're walking in pride because you're coming up against God, an unmovable, unchangeable object, person. How many know we need God for us and not against us? We need God on our side. But if you're walking in pride, God sets himself up against you and you just can't prosper that way. But if you, if you humble yourself before the Lord, then, then God's 
pours out his grace. He pours out his, his favor upon you. And I believe when God's grace pours out on your life, man, opportunities open up, doors open up that you, you didn't know anything about. Uh, you know, there's blessings that come that you did not earn, that you did not provide for yourself. Psalms 136, verse 6 says, the Lord is great and he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. God, God cares for the humble. Do you want to experience God's intimate, personal presence in your life? And do you want him caring for every detail of your life? Just right there, every need that you have, he's caring about that. Well, the scripture tells us how to do that, how to get that, and that is to walk in humility before God. But if we walk in pride, God will keep his distance. I'm talking about the benefits of humbling ourselves. You still out there? You gone home. Matthew 23, 12, Jesus said, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. I mean, if you're trying to lift yourself up and glorify yourself and make a name for yourself and a position and a status for yourself, then guess what? Humility is coming one way or the other, and it's probably not going to be real pretty if you don't do it personally yourself. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Hallelujah. God personally gets involved in your promotion if you humble yourself. Amen? And then uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3, this is the Phillips version, he said, how happy are the humble-minded for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. If you're walking in humility with God, two things happen. Number one, the kingdom of God becomes your inheritance. Number two, God throws happiness in on top of it. That's what the scripture says, happy. Anybody want to be happy here? Happy are the humble-minded for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, it's really our responsibility to humble ourselves. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And one of the ways that we can do that is fasting. David said in Psalms 35 verse 1, I humbled my soul with fasting. Well, how do you humble yourself? Well, there's probably more than one way, but David said this is one way. It, this is David, the, the king of Israel, the great king of Israel, the, the great psalmist who wrote most of the, most of the, uh, the psalms, in our Bible, he said, I humbled my soul with fast." David himself found the need to humble himself. And the way he did that is through fasting, abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. There's something about fasting and prayer that humbles our soul and makes us realize that we are far more dependent on God than we thought we were. It's so easy to walk in pride. So easy to rock in, in arrogance and, and independence and think that, you know, we can just handle it on our own. I really believe that many of our, our greatest problems stem from hidden pride in our hearts. You know, the Bible says our hearts are deceitful above all things and who can know? We can't even know our own hearts. So we need the Holy Spirit to reveal uh, these things to us. Just thinking about marriage, this thought kind of came to me this morning as I was thinking about the message that pride is really at the root of many of your problems in marriage, many of your arguments. The Bible says, uh, I think I got a scripture here, Proverbs 13, 10, where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Anytime there's conflict, in your marriage or in your relationships, I can guarantee you, according to Scripture, that pride is at the root. Pride is somehow involved in that situation. Amen? But wisdom is found in those who take advice. And until you get rid of the pride, you're not going to have unity. You're not going to have harmony. You're not going to have peace in your relationship. I want to say a word to husband. Husbands, Come on, you are the worst culprits when it comes to this. And don't look at me with that tone of voice because I've, I've walked that path before. I know what I'm talking about. You know, your marriage is sinking. Well, you're saying, bless God, I don't need any help. I don't need any advice. Blessed are those who take advice. I don't need any help in my marriage. I don't need any advice. We don't need marriage counseling. Bless God, we can handle this ourselves. I don't need anybody telling me how to do marriage. I guess my question is, how's that working for you? 
I like taking polls when couples come in for marriage counseling. I just say a simple question. How would you rank the health of your marriage from zero to 10? 10 being just wonderful, blissful. Zero is I'm dying here. And uh, it's just amazing how many times the guys will say, well, it's probably about a seven or an eight. Then I'll turn to the gal, what do you think? It's about a two, maybe. You know what I've discovered? Women are a better barometer of the health of your marriage, guys, than you are. So if the women are saying, it's not working, I'm not happy, you better start listening. And if that means getting marriage counseling, getting some outside help because you spent the last number of years trying to fix it, and and it's no better, but it's even worse, then you need to get some help. Amen? My wife and I, I was was just that way. I was 100% convinced that my wife was 100% of the problem in our marriage the first few years, and nobody could convince me otherwise. I was absolutely convinced that when she shaped up and she learned how to be a good wife and treat me the way I needed to be treated, things are going to go great. Hallelujah. After all, I'm the head of the home. I'm the, you know, king of the fort, whatever. (laughs) It didn't work very well. How many know that your spouse, I don't even know I'm talking about this. How many know your spouse is not your workmanship? God said, you and each one of us, he said, you're my workmanship. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And husbands or wives, doesn't matter, if you're there in there trying to fiddle with your spouse and trying to make them after your image, make them like you, just a little carbon copy of you, you know, do everything the way you do, say, think the way you do, have the same opinion that you have. I used to get threatened when my wife had a different opinion about things than I did. How stupid that is. What did I want? A little carbon copy of me? Ew. I think that's why God put Adam to sleep when he created Eve. He didn't want Adam in there messing with it. Well, God, I think you need to add this. Or I think you need to make her this way. He said, no, you're going to sleep, dude. I'm making her in my image. You and I don't have any business trying to change our spouse and make them like we want them to be. They are God's workmanship. And until I discovered that myself personally over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, whatever it was, uh, until I discovered that I needed to let God take care of my wife and me deal with me. What is it in me that needs to change? What is it in me that you want to sanctify and make like Jesus? And that's the only way that a marriage is going to work. And anything else other than that is simply pride. It's arrogance at the core of it. And you're going to have argument after argument and conflict after conflict until you figure that out. And actually, both my, it wasn't a one-way thing. Both my wife and I had to figure that out. She, she had a, 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 a morning, I think, one time when she was spending time with the Lord, and, and God began to reveal her heart toward me. And, and she was pretty sure that I was 100% of the problem. And God began to deal with her, and she had this session. I don't know how long it took. It was quite a, a long time when God just began to reveal, and she described it like vomiting all this stuff out, all the bitterness and, and anger and judgment. And, and at the same time, God was dealing with me. And when we started allowing God to deal with us and God to deal with the other person, uh, things really just naturally got a whole lot better. I mean, it was like night and day. The morning or the day after... No, it was the, the day that she actually had that time with God and let God deal with her heart, her judgment and anger toward me, her resentment and bitterness toward me. The very day I came home after work and walked into the house, I could tell there was a difference in the atmosphere of the home. I could tell it. There was something different. I, I felt free. I felt free to be myself. Sometimes our judgment locks another person really in bondage in the very behavior that we don't even like. 
And we got to get rid of that judgment, get rid of that bitterness, get rid of that anger. Forgive the person. Let God heal our hearts. And as something will change in the atmosphere, I guarantee you. It'll, be whole, it'll just be easier to do marriage. It's tough. It's t- marriage is tough enough, but it's tough, man, when there's strife. You know what strife is? It's an underlying, it's, it's just this under, underlying uh, tone of, of just anger and resentment. It's there whether you even talk about it or not. And maybe you, and we kind of got here uh, eventually where, you know, we just skirted around everything because we didn't want to get into an argument, but the strife was always there. So we weren't really having a, a real marriage. We were just plain marriage. We were just like roommates in the same house. That's, that's not what God intends. He said the two shall be one, a unity, a harmony. I'm talking to anybody. I have no idea why I'm talking about all this. <laughs> Praise God. Maybe God does. But we're talking about pride, right? I guess that came up. And uh, <laughs> just talking about pride. This, this is a transcript of a radio conversation of a U.S. naval ship with Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland in, in October of 1995. The American Navy transmits this message. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. The Canadians respond. Recommend that you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. The American Navy responds. This is the captain of the U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, no. I say again, you divert your course. American Navy, the captain's really ticked off by this time. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. The Canadians respond, this is a lighthouse. It's your call. And when we get stubborn and obstinate and and demanding in our our relationships, start trying to throw our weight around, it just doesn't doesn't work. And really, it's not just relationships. If your attitude in life is, "I, I, I really have life under control, I don't need a lot of help, or maybe even if your attitude is, God, I'd like your help, but if you don't come through, I've got plan B anyway. I've got plan B in my pocket. If you don't come through, I'm going to figure it out. You know what that is? It's pride. It's arrogance. I'm just sharing all this to maybe kind of unearth some of this that lingers in our heart. Because God wants you to set you free. He's not not condemning you. Like Freedom Night, they always shout hallelujah when God exposes something. Because that's, that's the freedom process. God's wanting to set us free from the stuff that's binding us up. Humility is recognizing our total dependency on the power and the grace of God. Our total dependency on the power and the grace of God. And it's pride to think that we can navigate through life without God. I'm smart enough. I'm wise enough. I'm creative enough. You know, I, I, I can get through life all by myself, just fine. But fasting brings us to a place of humility and dependency that, that opens the door for God to show His power and His blessing in our life. It's really easy to fall into the trap of self-dependency. It's very easy to do this. And uh, I, I really believe that our humility is best gauged by how, how much we rely on God. Our humility is best gauged by how dependent we are on Him in every area of our life. So fasting really brings you, again, brings your body, your soul under subjection. It says, soul, you're not in charge here. Soul, you're not in charge. Body, you're not in charge. The Spirit of God within me is in charge. There was a, there was a man in the Bible 
that demonstrated this kind of humility. His name was Ezra. Ezra was uh, leading a band of Jewish exiles out of captivity in Babylon back to Jerusalem. And uh, they had, they had to, it was a long journey and they were going to go through an area where there was a lot of bandits and robbers. It was kind of known for that. And they needed protection. For one reason, Ezra was taking, you know, the men were taking all their wives and all their children, so they needed protection for their families. But they were also taking the sacred vessels that had been captured from the temple in Jerusalem and taken into captivity. They were taking those back. And historians value the worth of the gold of those sacred, those sacred uh, uh, items at $160 million worth of gold. And then the value of the silver was about $15 million. That's $175 million worth of items, silver and gold, that they were taking back, going through this area that was known for robbers and bandits and, and thieves. And so obviously they needed uh, the protection of God. Now Ezra had <clears throat> two choices. He could ask the king for help or he could depend on God. He chose to depend on God, and this is what he did in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. It says, There by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey for us and our children and all of our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king and his soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road because we had told the king, The gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to Him. But his anger is against all who forsake him. So we fashioned, fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So Ezra chose to trust God rather than depend on human solutions for his problems. He didn't take a single step until he, he fasted and prayed. And I really think that God sometimes brings us to the end of ourselves. I think God brings us to the end of our own personal limits at times so that he makes us realize that we cannot depend on our own strength, our own creativity, our own ingenuity. I, I believe God brings us to the end of ourselves so we can come to the beginning of his power through humble dependence on him. It's a good thing to come to the end of ourselves when we know that we can step into that place of humble dependence on God with whom all things are possible. And amazing things happen when we start depending on God. Uh, I, I heard about this true story of a Christian electrical contractor um, who was involved in a very big project. He was working for a developer who happened to have just kind of a nasty temperament. This man was angry a lot and, and demanding and just kind of harsh. And uh, one day the developer calls this Christian contractor. He's very, very angry. He says, you're fired. I want you off the job. And man, the, this contractor stunned. He didn't know what was going on. On top of that, he said, I'm not going to pay you the, the money that, he, that, I, that, that you th are telling me that, you, that I owe you. Uh, the contractor already had $50,000 worth of work you know, into the job. So this guy owed him $50,000. He said, I'm not going to pay you. On top of that, the guy said, I'm going to sue you as well to get the building back to the way it was before you even put a hand on it. So this really put the business in a very bad, bad position. And the, the contractor was very concerned about that. He went to talk to his pastor and the pastor said, I recommend that you fast and pray. Well, he had never done that before. He didn't like the sound of it, didn't want to do it, but he was very desperate, so he, he did. He fasted and he prayed and he sought the Lord about this situation. And as he, uh, I'm just going to read uh, his words. He said, as, as I fasted and prayed, I felt like God wanted me to humble myself. I didn't know what God meant, but I felt like I was to call the owner, so I got on the phone and, grudgingly, and he grudgingly agreed to meet me face to face. And as I drove over, I was praying for God to show me what to do. As I walked into the office of the developer, I found him still angry, yelling, and swearing. When we sat down, I told him, I'm here to say I'm sorry for whatever miscommunication we had and whatever part my company played. I'd like to do the job, but first, I just want to tell you how sorry 
I am. He went on to say there was complete silence in the room. Then the developer said, well, I never wanted to fire you in the first place. I just got upset and I want you to do the job and I appreciate you coming in here. He said that day, the developer awarded my company an additional $3 million worth of work. He said, none of it would have happened if I would not have humbled myself with fasting and prayer and then obeyed what God told me to do. Fasting releases us from that deadly spiritual disease called pride and positions us to receive the blessing of God. Here, here's the second point. We won't spend as much time on this, but fasting secures divine favor in situations. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah was a, a Jewish man who had been exiled to, to Babylon. He was serving in the court of the king of Babylon as the cupbearer, very high position, important position. And one day, uh, Nehemiah hears word back from his hometown, Jerusalem, that the town, the city's in a mess. The, the walls have been broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. The people that are still living there are distraught. They're in disgrace. It's just a total mess. How does he respond? Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. When I heard about these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. I don't know how you respond to bad news, but Nehemiah fasted and prayed. You know, people respond to bad news in a lot of different ways. Some people, they escape through binging on Netflix. They watch, you know, 10, 10 episodes of their favorite show in a row. Or some people binge on their comfort food. Some people actually get involved in drugs and alcohol just as a way of escape. It's all, all a way of trying to escape the problem and escape the pain because I don't know what to do about the situation. I wonder what the outcome would be if it, instead of trying to escape, we'd actually fast and pray and seek God. In this situation, Nehemiah was actually fasting and praying for favor with the king. What he wanted to do is make a big, big request. He wanted to ask the king, he, said, he wanted to go to the king and say, King, I, I, I really would like to be free from this position for a period of time, several weeks, and I want to go and I lead a group of people and organize the people that are there to rebuild the walls of the, of the city and rebuild the gates. And, and would you release me to do that? Now, that's a big ask. Amen? I mean, the king had no incentive to do that. Why should he care about Jerusalem? Why should he care about releasing Nehemiah from his position in the king's court to go do that? And here's the deal. If the king was not happy with the request, number one, Nehemiah could lose his job. Number two, he could actually lose his head. That's just the way it was in those days. So, I mean, this is serious, serious business. So instead of trying to figure out the problem, Nehemiah fasted and prayed. In verse 11, it says, he prayed this, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer that of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor. Granting him what? Granting him favor in the presence of this man. Favor is when people are inclined to help you and to bless you, even though they have no incentive to do it, they're going to get nothing back. And many times they don't even know why they're doing it. But it's just God moving on their heart to give you favor. Ne Nehemiah made this request. Listen, not only did the king release him to go and do what he wanted to do, but he gave him military protection to get there. And then he said, any materials that you want, all the timber in my forest, whatever you need, it's, it's, it's yours to have. Here's my, you know, my stamp of approval. You just show this to anybody that, that you need materials from, and they're just going to help you. How many know that's favor? That's favor. Hallelujah. And it came as a result of his fasting and prayer. My question to you is, where do you need the favor of God? Where do you need God's favor? In some relationship, in some job situation? If you're in a business, you need favor. You need the favor of your clients. You know, if you have no clients, you have no business, right? So you need favor. If you're on the job, you need the favor of your employer. If you're looking for a job, 
you need favor. If you already have a job but you need a promotion or an increase, you need favor. You need that person or persons to be inclined to want to bless you, want to help you, want to give you opportunities. And the Bible says one of the ways that we can get that favor is through fasting and prayer. Amen? Well, next week I'm going to share about how fasting releases the power to break demonic strongholds in our lives and in the lives of others. And also how fasting opens us up to receive the guidance of God in our lives. So I want you to come back and hear the rest of this message, but let's stand this morning. And I'd like the worship team to come back up here, if you would. Worship team. We're going to do the same thing that we did last week at the end of the service. You know, during the season of fasting and prayer, nothing else is more important than hearing from God. Now, now if you're joining with us, I guarantee you don't have to run out to beat the Baptist to the restaurants, right? That's not an issue today. So we have a little bit more time, and I ended up early anyway. And last week, if you're here, you remember, uh, we opened up the altars and I invited you to come. If you need a breakthrough, if you need a touch from God, if you need to hear from God, if you got some situation where you need to hear what God's solution is to that problem or that situation, I'm going to invite you to do one of two things. Either, number one, come up here if you're comfortable with doing that, physically you're able to do that. And just find a place to pray. Our prayer team is going to come up and pray with you. And whether you spend two minutes, ten minutes, or more, that doesn't matter. It's just getting before God and and spending some time saying, God, I need you. I need you. Maybe you got convicted that there's some arrogance and some pride going on. And you're, you're going to come up here today and say, God, I want to get rid of this leprosy, this spiritual leprosy called pride out of my life. I want to become more dependent upon you. Maybe it's some other need. So number one, come up here. If you don't feel comfortable or you're just physically not able to do that, just stay where you're at. And uh, whether you stand or sit or you can find a place to lay on the floor, whatever it takes to get comfortable and just spend some time seeking God. I tell you what, we get in such a hurry. We get in such a hurry anymore. We got to run here and run here and do this and do that. But it takes time of waiting in God's presence to settle ourselves on the inside and hear from God. Now, if you need to go, don't feel like you have to stay. Just slip out and and do what you need to do. But if you're going to be in here, let this be a a place, an atmosphere of prayer and, and seeking God. Amen.